Yeah, hi. Yeah, I, I would like to speak about uh, Kubernetes or, and Hadoop, but more precisely, I would like to speak about distributed systems and containerized environment. Uh, I'm an Apache committer in Redis project, which is an incubator project, and this is a rough library for Java, which could be embedded, and in fact, it's embedded in the Hadoop, a new subproject in Hadoop, this uh, Apache, Ozo, Apache Hadoop Ozon and Apache Hadoop HDDS. I also have a experimental project when I'm trying to containerize the whole world, or at least the big data part. And I'm running the um, Apache big data projects in containers, in Dockerverse farm, Kubernetes, and in Docker Compose, and in other ways. OK. So I'm working for the Hortonworks, and a significant time of my daily job is just starting and stopping uh, Hadoop containers, and I really like it. I think it's a, it's a good job. It just depends what kind of tools are you used. And I'm pretty sure that using containers and containerization, it's uh, managing uh, Hadoop is more like something like this. So it could be more robust and more manageable. But this talk is about Hadoop, but to be honest, it could be any other kind of animal, because it's not strictly connected to Hadoop. You know, just, uh, I don't know if you know the feeling that you read some getting started guide and everything is fine, but with a real world application, it's not, <laughs> not, not that the case. So I use Hadoop because it's a very good ex example. It's a good old mature application. So if something could work with Hadoop, then I think we know the recipe to start any kind of distributed application in containers. OK, next question. Do you know what's this? I'm pretty sure you know because, yeah, this is from the European Union. This is a regulation that every household appliance should be tagged with some kind of label just to make it easier to compare, not just based on the price, but, for example, based on the energy consumption or the noise level or something like this. Yeah, it's, it's pretty smart. And what I'm wondering that how can I do similar labels to compare the, comp the containerized environments, for example, Kubernetes? How can I understand the key questions? And this is what I would like to do in this talk, just to label different containerized environment and learn what are the key questions which should be solved anyway with some kind of tools, for example, Kubernetes. Yeah, so for that one, we need some real-world um, applications or environments. So I will show multiple ones, but unfortunately, we don't have enough time to check all of the te te technical details. So we will use a simplified methodology, just check one good thing and one bad thing for, for every example. Actually, usually I'm more interested about the bad thing, right? That's the limitation. That's how, we will, how it will be failed. So that's what uh, we will uh, check it. OK, next question. Do you know what is Apache Hadoop? Hands on if you know. OK, most of them. OK. But to be on the same side, I have a very sh oh no, I have a complete Hadoop training actually in 60 seconds. This is the way how I explain what is Hadoop for or what I'm doing for my grandparents. So <laughs> it's just very high level. So sorry if you don't know the Hadoop, but it's enough for this presentation. Yeah. So Hadoop is a very popular big data toolset or big data application. Okay. Next question: What is big data? Well, this is the same as the small data, just just in big, right? So what is small data? Yeah, that's, that's the easiest question. I'm pretty sure that the small data is an Excel sheet, right? So big data is an Excel sheet which uh, doesn't fit on my computer, so you need multiple computers. And Hadoop could handle this. Yeah, the first problem is that we need to split it somehow and just store one part in one, com one node. That's what HDFS could do. And the next problem is that we need the same calculation. For for example, we need the maximum value uh, from the Excel sheet. So it's pretty easy, right? We need just calculate the maximum at every node, and after that, we need the maximum or the maximum. So this kind of calculation is handled by the YARN and other subproject in Hadoop. And we can write the calculation with the MapReduce framework, but it's not necessary. You can use any other, other framework or product like Spark, Flink. And in fact, we have a new or two new uh, Hadoop subproject, Ozon and HDDS. But yeah, there will be a presentation about them tomorrow. 
Okay, and you can imagine that Hadoop has a lot of uh, master components, worker components. We don't need to know all of the details about, but we have master components, worker components, and we would like to containerize them. Okay, let's start with the containerization. Okay, that's the Docker file, right? That's the containerization. Have you ever wrote something like this? Okay, but I think all of them, you, you, you can imagine that we, I have a base image, I'm adding a Hadoop, and yeah, that's all. Originally, the title of my presentation was, ho was How to Containerize Hadoop, and I just realized that, okay, it's, it's very easy. That's just one slide, right? Done. <laughs> yeah, the question is that how the containers could work together, right? We have some question, questions which should be answered, the configuration management, the provisioning, scheduling, and all of them. So that's not the, the tricky part is not the containerization itself, but running the containers together. Okay, so let's start with the configuration, just, just as an example. So this is the good old Hadoop-style configuration. I have no problem with that, that's XML, but yeah, I can do the same typos with XML and the YAML files, so it's no problem. Uh, another problem is that in Docker environment, typically I have a little bit different configuration. So the most Docker-native configuration is the environment variables, right? So this is a Docker Compose definition, and you can see that I have a base image, host name port, and environment variables. In fact, I can mount the XML files, but it's more harder to manage. So what I would like to use is just a set of uh, environment variables. So what can I do? Yeah, I can create a launcher script, so it's not a big deal, right? It's very easy to map something, and the launcher script could create the configuration files, and after that, the good old distributed application could be started. For example, the Hadoop. So it's just a few lines of code, and after that, I could have this kind of Docker Compose file. You can see that now we, I have some kind of uh, naming convention, and based on the naming convention, the starter script will generate the final configuration, so, and based on the extension, I can choose the um, format. So if it's an XML, it should be converted to a Hadoop XML format. Okay, done. Uh, Lesson learned here is that we would like to manage the configuration values, not the format. Format, it's, it's very easy, right? We can just convert it from one format to other format. But with Docker, it's easier to manage in environment variables, so we can manage it in environment variables. OK, so the first part is done. We, we know that if it's noisy or not, this uh, freezer. OK, so we have this. Uh, in, uh, the source of the configuration has been solved. Currently, we have no pre-processing, and there is no support for change. So if I'm, I would like to change something in the environment variables, I need to restart everything manually. OK, but there is, there is another big question. There are two main approaches to, to containerize big data applications. One is just put everything in one container. This is the easiest one, right? Just one container per node. And the other one, which usually is suggested by the Docker literature, to put every application in a separated small container. Yeah, this is the, usually this is the suggested way, but the left side is more easy, because we don't need to modify anything. Any kind of existing application could be started, just as it would be a node, the, the big container. So why, what is the best and, and why? That's the question. Yeah? We, we need to understand the why, if we need the freezer or not. Yeah, I prefer the, the right side, and not this is because it is suggested by the literature, but I think it's more, it seems to be harder, but after a while, it's, it's, it's just easier. Imagine if you would like to restart, for example, or, or upgrade the hive. With one big monolith container, you need to upgrade the container and restart everywhere. So it's more easier if the container is the unit of the packaging, and you can handle all of the application in a very same way. If you, for example, if you add something to the launcher script, then it will be available easily for every application. So the power of the containerization, at least in a local environment or in a Docker Compose environment, is inside the launcher script. So with the launcher script, we can do very powerful things, just we need to add this simple script, and if, environment, if any environment variable is set, then we can do some kind of magic. Okay, for example, this um, configuration transformation, but we can do any other uh, magic. For example, waiting for an other service. Or 
we can download any additional component, jar file, we can prepare the AD HDFS, Hadoop requires some kind of formatting before the first start uh, on the HDFS side, but it's very easy to adjust if we need format, and if, at, if uh, the directory is missing, just do a name not format. Yeah, we can also set up the credentials, enable Prometheus monitoring with Java agent. So it's more and we can do more and more complex in just with the launcher. My personal favorite is the last one. So I don't know if you know what uh, what is in in the wire between the Hadoop components. So you know that there is proto buffer and the Hadoop components are just speaking with each other. And in our launcher script, we have just a simple Java agent. It could be turned on because we handle all of the all of the applications in the same way, and yeah, this is a standard output where the log log standard log just replaced with the messages, which are uh, replaced between the name node and data node, the master and worker. So I can see all of the all of the network traffic with just one environment variable turning on. Yeah, I will. I really like it. So uh, if this is not the good thing, then I don't know what, what could be the good thing in, the, in this Docker Compose-based approach. But what is the bad thing? Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. And we use it uh, a lot of times during the development or just uh, provide the documentation for the new features. But the problem is that it couldn't work with multiple nodes, right? That's the, prob that's the biggest problem. We need a real production cluster. So what can we do? Yeah, we can start with Kubernetes. Everybody know. Everybody knows that Kubernetes is the new unicorn, so we can just try it out. But currently, we would like to understand the question and compare them based on the, the main categories. So it's very easy to win a competition if there is, there is nobody else in, in your category. So I just created somebody else to, to compare them with Kubernetes. And this is a, a HashiCorp stack-based uh, approach. Uh, well, it's more like a do-it-yourself approach because HashiCorp is a company who, who provides multiple smaller applications which are very powerful, but you need to assembly or you, you need to create your solution manually and, and just uh, adjust all of the components. How many of you uh, use Consul or, I don't know, Vault? Anybody here? Okay. So one of the one of the famous uh, product is Consul. It's a service discovery server. But if you have never seen it, you can imagine it as a, as a, a key value store. Actually, it's a little bit more than. For example, if the key is a service name and the value is an IP address, then you can retrieve the information ev even over a DNS interface. So it could work as a DNS uh, uh, server. Vault is an other. Uh, Application, again, you can imagine it is a key value store where the value is a secret. So it's some kind of secret management, but it has also some advanced capabilities, authentication, authorization, and dynamic secret generation. And Nomad is the scheduler. So it could run application on a node. So that's, that's our situation currently, right? So it's more than one node. That, that was our problem. So, and we have a Nomad agent. It's a Golang application, so it's very easy to start. And my problem is that I would like to start a container somewhere. I'm not interested where it will be started. It will be started somewhere by the scheduler, by Nomad. OK. And maybe I need four, four container, And it will be started when there are available capacities. OK. So this is the Hadoop cluster. I would like to start five data nodes and one name node, the master component. And I ask Nomad to start it somewhere. I don't know where it will be started, so it depends from the available capacity. So I don't know how. I can set that I need a data node at every node, but the name node will be started somewhere. OK, what's the problem with that? Yeah, the first problem is the networking. By default, the Docker provides an internal networking and node-specific networking. So between the no nodes, there is no connection. So one worker node here can't see the other worker node unless I do some very magic port mapping, which is not very manageable. So what can I do? Uh, 
one simple solution is just use the Docker host network. Docker host network means that, oh, Docker is very good. I need the Docker except the networking part. For the networking part, I would like to use the host, the, the host interface of, of the network. You can see that I, uh, my containers are here, and, but the IP address and the interface is exactly the same uh, as in the node. There are some limitations that I can't start the same service twice on the same node because I can't use the same port twice. But it's not a problem because it's Hadoop. I need just one uh, worker node at every node. So it could work. And it could be very powerful. So container is just a unit of the packaging. I don't need to use all of the features of the uh, dockers. OK, so these are some other uh, problems which should be checked with, with every containerized solution that how can I use the, what kind of network could be used between the containers if it's a multi-node container. Okay, but still there is another problem because that was our good old configuration and here I have a host name. So what should be written to here? What is the host of the name node? Well, I don't know because the name node this red container will be scheduled somewhere. So it could be node 4 or node 2. Who knows? I don't know. So we need some kind of service discovery because we need to configure the data nodes to access the name nodes. OK, what can we do? Yeah, and this is the place where we can use console. We need just a console at every node. And Nomad could save the information, the scheduling information, to console. Still, we need some magic because before the start, we need to modify the configuration of the data nodes, but we have already, already did it, right? We do, it's very similar. We need some modification on, uh, in the launcher script, and we can do it. OK, so let's check it from closer. I have, we have the Nomad. We have a container. We have a Java process, a Hadoop Java process in, in this case, but it could be any other kind of distributed application. We have a console. And during the scheduling, Nomad will start the Docker instance and save the data to the service information. Service name, IP address. So when the Java process is starting, we need some launcher. A good example is, a, is the console template, which is an open source project, which could render the final configuration, because we have good old application, which can't speak with console natively. And we can render the configuration and just start a Java process after that. And with this, um, uh, this setup, we have some other space for doing other powerful things. For example, we can restart the Java process in case of, uh, of server change. Right? Because we started the Hadoop Java process, we can listen on the service info uh, in the console and just restart the Java in case of configuration change. And we can also upload all of the configuration to the console because it's a key value store. And the console template can just download the configuration, render them based on the dynamic uh, uh, dynamic service info, the service name, and an IP address, and we can render the configuration and save it to the disk and start the Hadoop. Yeah, it seems to be a little bit complex, right? So uh, don't panic if you, if, you, if, you, if you can't follow it, but that's the feeling of this approach. Uh, actually, it's something like this. So it, it's a very do-it-yourself uh, application. Uh, yeah, I can also show, can it, maybe it's better to show from here, oh, why need a sudo for this? Oh, yeah, I have it. Oh, I have it here with more, with better resolution. So that is just the feeling of, of, of this approach. This is the UI of the console. You can see that I have multiple nodes there. At the bottom, I have two worker nodes. Those are the console logs of the, of the two worker node. So this is the console. Uh, I can see the services. I have the name node, for example. The name node is scheduled at Nomad 2. In that case, I can check the configuration. All of the configurations are uploaded to here. OK, this is the HDFS configuration. I can check it. You can see here is the magic, right? This will be replaced during the startup. OK. But let's go forward. I have other configuration as well. Yeah. For example, the log4j properties. And I can just start. Oh, I, I can modify this. 
for example, the info level to debug level, and I can just save it. Uh, that's the save button. And what you can see here, that I just click to the save in the console, and it's automatically reloaded, all of the configuration. So this is debug logs are there. So everything works without any modification. So I think it's a, it's a very, very powerful uh, tool. Oh. <laughs> That's. And the, to do all of this, yeah, this, this is what I mentioned. This is the on change. We can restart the, restart the application without any modification in the, in the application itself. So it's, it's very powerful to use. Yeah, it's a little bit do-it-yourself, but it, it could be very useful. And the other big advantages of this approach that this is not just cloud native, but it's Hadoop native. Because this is exactly the same way how the Hadoop was tested in the last, I don't know, 10 years. Right, because we are using a Docker host network. This is exactly the same network as usually the Hadoop is used, so no problem with that. Okay, but let's compare it with the, with do, with the Hadoop, uh, with the Kubernetes approach. If the HashiCorp version was the do-it-yourself, the Kubernetes is the out-of-the-box version. Okay, do you know Kubernetes, or do you use Kubernetes? Okay, half of them, very good. I have an other full Kubernetes training in 60 seconds, or maybe <laughs> two minutes. Okay. So what is Kubernetes? The situation is the same. We have nodes, right? And I would like to, I would like to start the containers, and I don't care where they will be started. They should be started where I have enough capacity. So it could be hundreds of nodes. Okay. Another application, I need two containers, they will be started, or I need three containers, they will be started. The big difference is between Nomad and, and Kubernetes that um, Nomad is just a scheduler. It could start and it couldn't do anything else. For example, the network problem was not solved, right? We solved it with Docker network. And, but with Kubernetes, the Kubernetes can see these containers as an as a application. So they are tied together. And it could solve all of the other problems, the network problems. Yeah, it's pluggable, but we have multiple options to provide some kind of uh, networks between the containers. We have solution for the storage. So that's the out of the box. Out of the box, we have all of these um, features. For example, any kind of configuration or secret could be mounted as an external uh, mount point or a file and will be available from all of the container in the, in the same application. And all of the complexity of the Kubernetes is just all of these resources, or most of these resources are just definition or some kind of rules to say that, oh, where this kind of containers should be started. For example, the daemon set is a rule to start something on every node, or I could have a replica set when I say that, okay, this should be started on just, it doesn't matter where, but I need five instances. So all of this uh, complexity is just, in fact, just a rule to start the containers somewhere. Okay, it seems to be pretty cool, right? We, we finished. That's, that sounds good. Everybody knows that it's cool. What's the problem with that? Well, there is no problem with that exactly, but the thinking of Kubernetes is different from the thinking of the Hadoop. For example, this is a backend application. I defined that I need three instances and it's just scaled up. Good. I have a front-end application, and I need some kind of connection between the front-end and the back-end. It's a good old front-end application, so it, uh, it uh, doesn't know if the back-end is scaled up or not. So there is another Kubernetes uh, uh, resource type, the service, which, could, which works uh, as a load balancer. And the problem here is that the service has a network identity, a DNS, but the pods or the containers itself has no network identity. What do we need for the Hadoop? Yeah, we need DNS, or it could be turned off, but typically we need network identity because we solved all of this replication problem manually, so we, we could be, do it more effectively, but we need uh, network. Uh, network names between the components because we are just managing uh, the replicas and 
doing all the stuff. So it could be started without DNS, but it's not an easy. There are a lot of options, just turn off, turn off, turn off, turn off. And, and that's the part where the nomad-based uh, approach was Hadoop native, because it could work as before with DNS. But here, it's more tricky. Yeah, but we have, we have this stateful set where we have a, a Kubernetes container or pod together with a network identity, and it could be used. And in fact, this is the mostly used resource type for, for Hadoop and, and stateful application. A small problem that we can't use the other resources, just the stateful set. For example, the daemon set couldn't be used easily, even if it's so cool to start something at every node. OK, so that was, it, it was not a bad thing, actually. It's just a difference between the thinking of Hadoop and Kubernetes. Kubernetes tries to manage all of the good, old, and dummy applications, and we have a very smart uh, distributed application. But we can use a res restricted set of the Kubernetes resources, and it could work very well. OK, so what is the good thing? I think it could be defined in, in multiple ways, but my favorite two things is the ecosystem and the flexibility. So what, uh, what does it mean exactly? So let's uh, do some example exercise. So do you know Prometheus? Do you? Oh, okay. Prometheus is a cloud-native uh, monitoring tool. And uh, this is something like this monitoring tool, collects a lot of metrics, and we can just check what's happening. OK, so I would like to use Prometheus together with Hadoop. By default, Hadoop um, doesn't support pr uh, Prometheus. So what can we do? Well, there are two. Uh, Prometheus is it's, uh, very simple. So it's a server application, and by default, it pulls uh, the components, and each component should provide an HTTP endpoint where the metrics are published. So we need two things. One is a HTTP endpoint here and here, and in all the data nodes. Hadoop doesn't have it, so we need some magic. And the other one, what we need, that Prometheus should know where are the HTTP endpoints. You know that we have a lot of containers. I don't know where they are started. So flexibility and ecosystem. Let's start with the ecosystem. What I mean on ecosystem, that it's something like the Git. You can't start a, you can't uh, create a new developer tool without Git support, I guess, right? Because Git is it's, it's supported everywhere. It's, it's very widely uh, used. And I think sooner or later, it will be the same for Kubernetes. So the ecosystem means that we have a lot of tools, and more and more tools support the Kubernetes environment. For example, Prometheus, because it's, uh, it's under the same cloud native uh, foundation, it's, uh, it supports uh, natively the, uh, the Kubernetes, so it can just retrieve the available services from the Kubernetes API and check where are the HTTP uh, endpoints are started. This is something like this. So this is a Kubernetes resource definition. You don't need to understand all of the things. You need to just uh, find the difference between the two slides. So that's the good thing. We need just add two annotations. And because Prometheus is listening in the Kubernetes API, if something is started with these two annotations, it will be pulled automatically. So this is the ecosystem. And it's not just the Prometheus, so a lot of other uh, uh, applications and just newer and newer application will will uh, support this kind of um, uh, we support Kubernetes in this way. Okay, so let's go forward. Still, we have a problem. So Prometheus knows that where the name node and data node will be started and where the HTTP endpoints will be started, but we have no HTTP endpoint, right? Because it's Hadoop. Hadoop has JMX, no HTTP endpoint. What can we do? Yeah, we can modify Hadoop, but that part is the flexibility, you know, uh, ecosystem and flexibility. So until now, I said in the Kubernetes, we have containers and the containers are started. Yeah, that was a little bit high level. So in fact, we have no containers, but pods. Pods are the basic unit in, in the Kubernetes world. And yeah, it contains one container and a few other things. For example, the volume, def volume definition that, for example, which secret should be mounted to the pod. And usual, usually one pod is one container. But in some special cases, we can put 
two containers in the same pod. So two containers will be started in the same host. And, and it's not just started in the same host, but they could see, uh, they can share a lot of things. For example, the same network interface will be used, the same volume or even the same processes. So it's, a, it's an alpha feature, but we can turn it on, and both of the containers will see the, the same processes. So this is the sidecar pattern, and imagine that this is my good old Hadoop application. This is a sidecar application which will be started. It's an other container, and it just checks the processes, and it will start an HTTP server and publish all of the JMX interfaces, publish all of the JMX monitoring information from the Java process. So it can check the Java process, get all of the information, and publish here. Oppa. Oh, something has been happened. So, again, this is, this is just two lines, right? So that's the flexibility. So it's, it's very easy. This is just one example. There are other examples to, to check the Kubernetes API and use operator. But this is an example that just with two lines, without modifying the good old Hadoop, everything is published to Prometheus without any, any other change. And it works not just for the Hadoop. This works for every Java application. So I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. And back to the ecosystem, that ecosystem also means that, yeah, it, it includes the fact that it's also a common language. So s even now, most of the cloud providers support Kubernetes, so it's very easy to run um, the application in the same way on-prem or in the cloud. Okay, so we did it, I think. That's the, that's the final label for, for Kubernetes. And I didn't mention all of these things, but most of them are out of the box included. Or we have an external tool in the ecosystem, such like the Helm, which is some kind of package management. The config map is another Kubernetes resource set. We have this multi-host multi support with the um, with, uh, pluggable. This is a pluggable interface, and there are multiple options to use uh, network between the containers. This is just one set, so you can, you can do it multiple ways. For example, you can use console for the, for the configuration, or you can use Docker host network to achieve a more Hadoop native approach. So there are just elements, and you can use it uh, in multiple ways. But what I would like to say that if we are comparing uh, the freezers or the or the washing machines before we buy it, then we can compare the containerized environment as well. And I think uh, these are the most important questions which should be answered somehow. Anyway, okay, that was the that was the summary. So don't buy without checking the the label. The other one is that the containerization can help a lot. So. We saw that with this, uh, just with three lines or four lines, we got some monitoring. And this is, the, this is true for log, collect, log collection, for example. It's just a few lines because a lot of tools are available for the containerized environment, and especially for, for Kubernetes. Then, then it's, it's, I, I believe that it's more effective to use um, these kind of applications in Kubernetes. And the uh, third one is just, it's, uh, the question is, that how do Hadoop, is Hadoop cloud native or, or not? So it depends, but I think it's almost. So Hadoop is designed to be a distributed application, so it's very easy to start containers. There are some limitations, for example, this DNS thingy, uh, which could be improved, but they, they are not uh, big architectural changes, just uh, small changes. But I think we, we, we need to uh, add to Hadoop. Okay, that's pretty much all. Uh, this is my availability. You can check almost all of the codes, not in a very well documented format, but you can see my work, all of these Docker uh, images and Kubernetes definition. And I will have another talk tomorrow about, I think, it, I think the title is the same, but it will be, 
more about Hadoop and Hadoop Ozone and Hadoop HDDS and how Hadoop could uh, provide some kind of persistent storage to Kubernetes um, clusters. So that's all. Is there any question? First of all, very good talk. It's very visual, so I like it very much. <laughs> Thanks. Um, about the sidecar approach, about uh, pr uh, having Prometheus metrics, uh, yeah. this uh, function of having the containers in the pod share processes, the alpha feature, as you mentioned. Have yeah. you looked at uh, Push Gateway for Prometheus? It's a server that you can push metrics and have it exposed since Prometheus is a pull Yeah, it's all, also, also, prob also possible to use okay. Push, but the native mode is just the pool model. So usually Prometheus, it's yeah. easier to use the pool model. Yeah, yeah. So. so that's why the second container, the second image that you have, like GMX uh, uh, sidecar, sorry, yeah. <laughs> making you go back to slides. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. In, where is it? It's in the Kubernetes. Somewhere. I think it's in the YAML configuration kind of. So I, uh, in yeah. fact, it's more. Co I, I simplified a little bit the story. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But if if you are interested, oh, that's somewhere. Yeah. Things forward. Here. Forward. Oh, okay. In in fact, you know that there is a Java attachment API, and what's happening here in my container that is checking all of the processes. In if there is a, a Java process, a new Java agent will be attached to the Java, which contains internally this, this code. This is exactly the, almost the same as the Java Prometheus exporter. Mm -hmm. So it just uh, reads the JMX and will be ex exported. But in fact, the HTTP is here. But I uh, simplified oh. a little bit the story. Cool. It also could be done with a different way to just read the JMX and publish from here. But right. that's, the, that's the, how it works currently. Cool. Awesome. But Good. it's 10 lines of batch code, actually. Yeah. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um question. So you had um as a statement or maybe also as an uh, um question at the end. Um so Hadoop um as as being a first-class citizen in a containerized environment. Yeah. So my question would be, so if I have now Hadoop running, um, have Yarn there and um, deploy my apps in that environment, so isn't that then a container in a container? So why wouldn't I am um, thinking of porting my Yarn apps so that they are then native to Kubernetes? It's okay. I think it's more, yeah. It, it, it's a complex question, but it's, it's mostly about Yarn, right? The scheduling part. That what about the scheduling? And uh, yeah, there, there are two kinds of scheduling in, in Yarn. One is just schedule native MapReduce application, and the other one is, is scheduling Docker. I think it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable way to run uh, MapReduce jobs inside a container in Yarn. But for example, the Spark follows another approach. Spark natively could be scheduled jobs on, on Kubernetes, so it's another approach. I think currently the Yarn, um, Yarn has better scheduling than the Kubernetes, but I think the Kubernetes ecosystem, it's, it's more advanced. So there are multiple options, and I, I can see in the future, but one option could be just, uh, yeah, I think the real value in, in Yarn is the scheduling part and not running the containers. I think running containers could be done in a more effective way with, with Kubernetes, but this is my personal uh, opinion, so. Thank you. Yesterday, there was a talk by Ted Dunning who mentioned also um, Kubernetes, and one of the key problems he touched there is storage. So where do you put the data in uh, in this kind of setup, in uh, yeah, there are so in this where is I need a, a Hadoop cluster. Is this a Hadoop cluster? Oh, let's imagine this is a Hadoop cluster. Oh, not this one, but this one. So by default, the Hadoop could. So there are different answers for different applications. But speaking about Hadoop, um, we have the data nodes who can, the data nodes, data nodes can 
uh, handle all of these uh, storage questions. So by default, uh, the easiest way is just use local storage here, because anyway, it doesn't matter if it will be uh, lost or not, because we have a replication mechanism by Hadoop between the no nodes. So we don't need any network storage. We need fast local storage, even SSD or something like this. And one interesting thing about the new Hadoop sub-project, for example, uh, the Apache Hadoop HDDS and Apache Hadoop Ozone, that the plan is that the, this storage cluster could provide storage for the map reuse or Spark job, could uh, provide a S3-like object store, and could provide network storage for the other containers, similar to the NFS. So the, currently it's used iSCSI, but later it could be improved. So it, in that case, you will have one storage cluster inside Kubernetes, and you can use it as a, a HDFS store, you can use it as an object store, and you can use it as a Kubernetes native block store by, uh, from other containers. At least that's the plan. Okay. Uh, thanks, Martin. We anyway ran out of time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much.